Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to the Great Conf people for having me uh, once more. I actually arrived yesterday, la late last night, and I was like, I thought I was going to sleep in a boat, but apparently that was four years ago, so uh, my sense of time is not working very well. Uh, it's got worse since I only had four hours sleep last night. But anyway, you're not interested in this stuff. Uh, this is about application architectures in Grails, and I'm hoping for a thought-provoking talk here. So, how do you build applications in Grails? Well, you start off with your domain model. This is a classic one. I use this in all my examples whenever I want to start something new. A book plus an author. These are my domain classes. And then, of course, let's get a web application up and running as quick as possible. We scaffold those. Book controller, author controller. And then we kind of introduce something that's a little bit longer-lived um, and introduce service and controllers and views. Okay, and that is your application architecture in Grails. So, thank you. Um, I think we have time for questions, if anyone's interested. <laughs> yes, you got it. I am only joking. Uh, otherwise, I was hoping for a very quick two-minute talk. <laughs> uh, the big question is, like, how many people do their Grails applications in that way? I do it all the time. Yes, look around, you're not alone. Um, we have to answer this question though. Is it always the best architecture to go with? Now, I'm not here to say it's crap, you should never use it. That's not what I'm here for. But uh, I don't think that you should be using it by default. And the problem, uh, possibly problem is the wrong word, but Grails directs you to this uh, approach. Start with your domain classes, uh, build services in front of them, and have thin controllers. Which is okay uh, up to a point. But why do we start with these things called domain classes? Uh, especially when Uncle Bob... Everyone heard of Uncle Bob, yes? Uncle Bob Martin. Famous, uh, very opinionated, loves test-driven development and uh, lots of other things. He, he writes a lot. He did a blog post in 2012 entitled No DB. So if you haven't read that, just Google it. Or sorry, web search it. Use Bing if you want. I always Google. Um, the data, but it basically summarizes down to this. The database is a detail that you don't need to figure out straight away. Okay? And that's quite fundamentally different to the way many Grails applications are approached, where you deal with your persistence classes, your domain model, first. There is kind of a different approach, um, and there was, there's a whole book on domain-driven design. Uh, the problem uh, in Grails world is that we already have the domain model, but in Grails, the domain model is actually the persistence model. Domain-driven design is more about um, thinking how, uh, how your application should work, neglecting all integration concerns. So persistence, messaging, email, all of these things are integration concerns. So now take the approach I want to have a conceptual model, preferably one that has no integration concerns, one that gives me enough information about my problem domain that uh, it can evolve with changing requirements and uh, I can work with it easily. Uh, every time new requirements come in, it's easy to refactor. So uh, as an example of where it can go wrong, Everything okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, example of where things can go wrong was uh, another pro project. I think Fergal will remember this one uh, because I, he was working at the same company at the same time. And there was this requirement for meetings, a meeting planner. And this sounded very simple. And unfortunately, the project manager, everything else was fixed. The database schema was fixed for everything except this one feature. And the, guy, the project manager said, hey, you can, you can go with whatever schema you like. 
Uh, and I think that was probably the worst thing he ever did to me. And I took the standard Grails approach. I tried to model it with the main classes. And to be honest, I was never happy with that particular solution that I came up with. I actually apologized to the guy who was following up to actually maintain this bit of code. I said, I'm sorry, it's shit. It's difficult to understand. Um, and has anyone else done this? Has anyone else apologized for code they've written? Thank you. Look around. There are others that have done this. Uh, it happens to the best of us um, and to the worst of us. So what had happened was um, the integration concern, the database stuff, was constraining me in how I modeled these meetings and uh, trying to do it within a service that was using these domain classes, these persistence classes. It just didn't work out. Uh, the best architectures I ever come up with are pure in-memory ones. So this is why I want, I really, if you don't learn anything else, I want you to at least stop thinking domain classes or persistence classes first. So think of a domain model in the sense of physics from school. Back in school, we were told many, many things, uh, levers and pivots and pulleys and all of these things. Uh, one classic example is a ball rolling down a ramp. So when you come across these examples in your exam, it's a very, very long question. It's a long question because it says, assuming that the ball is hard, rigid, smooth, the ramp is smooth, all of these things, make these assumptions. Why do we make these assumptions? So that we can then use some simple equations to work out how fast is that ball going to be uh, spinning at the bottom of the ramp. Okay? And that is a model. And we've said, we don't care about things like friction. We don't care about the roughness of the ramp. We don't care about any bumps in it. And this is the way to think, this is one way to, I think, the way to think about domain models in applications and architectures. And we can take something like that and give a rough approximation for Zorb rolling down a hill. You know, it's not going to be perfectly accurate, but it may be good enough for your particular problem. If you want to get it down to the nearest second, then you need to introduce the uh, friction, um, the fact there are bumps, the fact that the absorb may actually jump off the ground. You need to introduce these variables. But you have to ask yourself, how much value are you gaining by introducing the extra complexity? Now, in Formula One, they use computational fluid dynamics. This is complex stuff, very expensive computationally. But the extra seconds that they eke out are the difference between winning lots of money and not winning. So it's worth their while. But these models, they are evolving things. They don't stay the same from the beginning of the project to the end. Don't expect them to. They should be amenable to change. And ultimately, remember what you're trying to do. You're trying to solve a business problem. So it's important to ensure you have a good model of that business problem. So now, let's look at an application slightly differently. Uh, this diagram is from my friends at uh, Simplicity itself. And the idea here is you have your domain, everything else is an integration concern, including persistence. So get your model right, then decide what you should be, how to integrate with a, a database, and also which database should you use. Uh, I was asked just before this talk whether I was going to talk about MongoDB versus a relational database. Um, it's difficult to know. It depends on your problem domain. But as long as you get the model right first, it's a little easier to swap between the different types of persistence model. Ultimately, I did say I'm reading more and more uh, that 
uh, MongoDB has fewer and fewer use cases th than people thought. Um, who's using MongoDB in sort of a production application? Anyone here? Uh, so about five or six, seven hands. Um, I read more, you know, like Ur Urban Airship seems to start it, they said. I start with MongoDB, hit its limitations, went back to Postgres. So more and more people are switching back to relational databases for their core uh, database model. So here's an example of thinking differently, approaching a business problem in a different way from the standard Grails approach. So there was a uh, project that part of it was involved in generating reports from databases. This is not uncommon. Lots of people in the business world need to generate reports. So it was originally implemented, you have your controller, it calls a service that aggregates the data, and then the controller sends that data to Jasper. Okay. And you'd get your PDF report. And all is good. But it got difficult when another requirement was introduced and said, well, now we want HTML reports and we want paging. Now, paging makes life more difficult because do you do the paging at the database level or do you get all the results and then page or what? Of course, it depends on how much data you're dealing with. If you've got hundreds of thousands of records, you don't want to pull all of that into memory. And now this raises the question of who is responsible for uh, getting the data, who is responsible for paging the data, who is responsible for generating the HTML? Is it the controller? Is it the service? There's no, the fact is we have not encapsulated the idea of a report into our model. We've just got controllers and services and a domain model. The reports have a different form to the actual domain classes, so it doesn't work at the domain class level either. So there was a different approach taken. Let's assume that each HTTP request contains the query parameters for a report. It's all the information you need to get a particular report. And now that is used to populate a new object called a publisher report. And that can interact with services or domain classes directly. But when you uh, ask the publisher report for its data, it will do the appropriate querying. It will handle the pagination. And what does this look like? In Grail's world, it looks like a command object. You bind the data to the command object, but now, rather than having an anemic command object, we actually add behavior to it. And this is kind of one solution to um, Martin Fowler's complaints about the anemic domain model. He wasn't talking about anemic persistence classes. He was talking about an anemic domain model, modeling your actual business domain. So suddenly, we have a nice solution. The controller is very thin. Uh, all you do is use Jasper Renderer or uh, report as JSON or generate HTML from this report object. The report object is responsible for generating the required data. And now you can generate all sorts of different reports. So we've just approached the problem in a different way, with a different solution, and suddenly things become a lot easier. Hopefully many of you have experienced this in the past. I know I have. Just change it, adding some extra classes, rearranging them, suddenly things become magically easier. So you have to ask yourself, what is your domain? This is the main thing. And you actually have to continually ask yourself this throughout the life of a project. The requirements affect your domain model or what your domain model should be. Do you need extra complexity or can you remove some complexity and simplify it elsewhere? And you can also ask the question of, does your domain model represent what the user sees, for example, the report, 
Is that the domain model, or is it something that more closely resembles the database layer, your persistence classes? So um, if it's closer to what the user sees, command objects actually make a good option. If it's closer to domain, uh, persistence, then domain classes. If it's somewhere in between, use just standard groovy classes. That's fine. It's easy. And remember, Grails makes it quite easy to copy from one object to another. It feels like duplication of effort. It feels like not dry, not DRY, not don't repeat yourself. Um, but in terms of having a proper conceptual model, copying data uh, and including or excluding properties uh, can make life a lot easier. You, know, you can take dry a bit too far. Another example that I thought of was Twitter. Twitter has, if you want to update Twitter, what do you do? you write a 140 character or less post. And that is it. Your post may include references to other users. It may include hashtags, great conf. I hope everyone's tweeting hash great conf at the moment. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. But if you then look at the homepage, a uh, user's timeline, You've got a profile, how many users uh, I'm following, how many followers I have. I'm up to 3,000 now. Yay! Um, so this is, slide is a bit out of date. But uh, you've got the suggestions, discovery, all of these things, which are actually quite complex data. But it doesn't really have much to do with posting a single message. The point of this is that Updates are a very different model to queries and retrievals. You're querying for different information to what you're updating. And there is an architecture that is designed specifically for this. It's called CQRS, uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So command represents the data updates, query the reading of data. So you have your updates going to one database. Every time you get an update, you actually update a set of other data stores, possibly MongoDB, possibly Redis, uh, and they have the stuff that is useful for the queries. So your profile data, your uh, discovery information, things like that, you can have in a separate database. And it means that your queries can be very fast as well because they're just like, get me that document out of MongoDB. That is a fast operation. You don't have to execute three, four, five joins. So this is the main thing from the talk. It is uh, think about what your domain model is, and from there try to work out the appropriate architecture for you. Now services, controllers and services may work really well. But do you know that in advance before you've worked out an actual domain model? That's the question. OK. So what about actual uh, architecture? So everyone knows the controllers and, and services approach. Uh, but there's a big driver for change in application architectures, the way you develop these things. Rich clients. So we're not talking Warren Buffett here. We're talking Gmail. Yeah. Uh, either heavy JavaScript or iOS or what have you. You know, these are 2012 numbers, uh, 400 million Android activations, 365 million iOS. Of course, that's skyrocketed since. Uh, imagine if everybody was ac accessing your application. You go, yes, right before your application crashed. Um, not everybody has this problem. Again, you have to think about it. Are you going to suffer from this problem? But the fact is that lots of concurrent connections is uh, changing the game in terms of internal architecture. Uh, for a start, most people, a rich client means that you typically don't use site mesh and GSP. You use AJAX and JSON endpoints. But since the client is displaying a page while waiting for data from the back end, then you can do things asynchronously on the back end. It's uh, quite a nice model. So do we need site mesh and, and GSP? 
do we all just going to do rich clients? Well, imagine that the whole Java web start and swing and all those things worked out. I actually worked on an application once, which was a swing application delivered through the browser talking to a EJB2 backend. That was back when we thought EJB2 was cool or was the right thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, didn't, didn't learn from Rod early enough. It was only two or three years later. Uh, but still, um, would you use this, would you use a Java web client for everything? Would it make sense for Wikipedia? To be honest, I don't think so. Uh, and for that reason, I think there is still use cases for the server-side generated pages, HTML pages. Okay, so this doesn't mean that everyone needs to shift over and go to rich clients and do everything asynchronously. That's not what I'm saying. There are, there's still room for all of these uh, architectures and uh, models. Okay, so um, also, if you, even if you do go for rich clients, you typically use a client-side templating framework, uh, handlebars, moustache, something like that. Uh, but you still need an original page, the source page, the, the first page that gets loaded. Rob Fletcher is doing a talk on how to uh, use, say, handlebars to render that initial page as a server-side generated page. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, check out Rob's talk. Okay, so let's assume that uh, we're anticipating tens of thousands of uh, clients. Then you need to think about async because the problem is without it, you, you're suffering from the thread pool issue. Every time a request comes in, it holds onto a thread and you're limited on the number of threads. Okay, so you're not gonna get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of threads at the same time. So Grails, uh, uh, I can't actually remember which version of Grails switched to Servlet 3, introduced Servlet 3 and async. Was it Grails 2? 2 zero. I know, I know a few Grails committers are in the back row and they're just ignoring me. Um, never mind. Anyway, it's, it's already there. <laughs> was it Grails 2? The async was first introduced. Yes, Grails 2. Um, now uh, it's uh, the default. So the idea here is that every time a request comes in, you detach your work from that thread. And that means that the request can, that thread can be returned to the pool and handle another request. So it's all geared towards having as many concurrent requests as possible. Grails course makes this significantly easier now uh, with the Promises API. So if you haven't seen this, definitely check it out in the user guide and have a go. So the task method is the key here. Um, and this allows you to do some work externally. For example, we can generate the report. While we're generating the report, the request thread has been returned to the pool and is possibly handling another request, okay? And then when the task is finished, the report generation, it attaches back to a uh, request and you can render the response. And you can do all this through the Grails Promise API. Uh, one thing to look at is, okay, this expensive report generation, uh, what's happening there? Well, typically, it's this model. HTTP request comes into the controller, uh, and then it offloads to a worker thread pool. What happens when everybody is asking for a report? Well, yes. The request threads keep being uh, returned back to the pool and you can handle lots of connections. Unfortunately, you've got to you've, all you've done is move the problem down the stream to the worker pool thread. You're going to run out of threads to actually generate reports. So uh, you do still, this doesn't magically solve your scalability issues just using it. It helps, but you have to understand how, what the 
uh, metrics of your application are. Are people, are most people, hitting a few cheap pages and only a few of them are doing expensive stuff? Or are more people doing expensive things? In which case, you're just bottlenecking at a different location. Ultimately, this is all about making efficient use of server resources. And uh, you know, the reason that Node.js is so popular is because it can run... Actually, okay. The reason it's so popular is because there are a load of JavaScript developers who want to do stuff on the server side. That's my controversial opinion. But uh, additionally to that, it has very, because it's asynchronous in nature and all the I.O. is asynchronous, it is very efficient resource-wise. You hear about people replacing four or five Rails application instances with a single node app which runs in less memory than any one of those Rails applications. And that is because it's geared towards applications that do a lot of I.O. but not a lot of um, processing. So if you're doing computational fluid dynamics, Node is probably not what you're after. But if you're doing something like a walkie-talkie application, all you're doing is sending streams, routing streams of data, uh, possibly talking to a database. There's a lot of I.O., not much CPU-intensive stuff. So um, these, these are all things you need to think about when you're talking, looking at... Um, application architecture. And ultimately, you do need to remember that concurrency is not easy. You know, I remember a time, uh, my first job when I got back from traveling, and uh, I was asked to do one part of uh, uh, a, was it a workflow system. It was a Swing application, and we were kind of trying to work out how to model it. You know, Swing applications were easy. We didn't need to worry about a database. Modeling the application was the easy part, uh, apart from this thing where we had to do something concurrently. We had to use threads. And I was like, I think we should do this using the new um, like queues, the new concurrency primitives in Java 5 at the time. So this is a long time ago, uh, possibly showing my age here, I don't know. But. Um, the answer to this was, no, 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 no. Just share this list, this in-memory list. Just share it between multiple threads and use the synchronized keyword. See, multi-threading is easy because we have the synchronized keyword in Java. At which point, I almost face-palmed in front of them. Um, I could not believe that that was still at the forefront, that people were still thinking that, even back then. And no matter what technologies you use, concurrency is still hard on the brain. It is. And ju you just admit that, and life will become easier, or a little less stressful. OK, so um, one way of uh, doing sort of concurrency and spreading load and, and making yourself scalable is the Netflix approach. You know, you have an a application which then accesses various remote services. People are going to tell you about microservice architectures, and they are great and will solve all of your problems. Um, certainly, they do help solve a set of problems. Um, at Netflix's scale, I'm not sure they could have done anything else. Uh, it ensures that you decouple your um, domain, that you've got properly focused services. Uh, you're not you're not tempted to have all of those spaghetti code because you can't, because you now have to bridge across HTTP or a message broker or something like that. So it does help in that regard. But now you have to worry about failures from the post service and tag service just because of the network. So that adds complications. Um, this is where I feel that uh, Grails doesn't work currently terribly well with this because you currently get everything um, in, a, in a Grails application, whereas microservices, you, you need minimal stuff. You can still have a Grails application, exclude GORM, or use GORM for REST, and uh, use REST to access backend services, and that works fairly well. 
but they're actually the services themselves. This is where I feel that Grails 3 is, is the next step that, we, that needs to be made. You know, enable you to remove things like uh, GSP if you're never using it, remove GORM, uh, remove Site Mesh, remove all of these things that are part of core. So hopefully Graham will be talking about Grails 3 tomorrow and some of these ideas. Uh, so this is certainly uh, one approach. Use your remote services. People do do that. But do be aware that you've got a more complex deployment system. You have to deploy multiple applications and you have to build in some form of fault tolerance. What happens when the network goes down between these services or individual services go down? Um, Netflix have a whole host of libraries. Uh, Hystrix is one I just discovered for making it easier to deal with these types of problems. Okay? But if you don't want to go the whole hog, you can actually think internally, use a messaging architecture. And this gives you many of the same benefits, uh, the decoupling. So instead of one object calling another one directly, just use a router. And one of the advantages of this, uh, other than it's great for concurrency because messages are not in memory mutable data structures. They're immutable. So one, you don't have to worry about uh, mutable memory. But also we can very easily split out another object into the cloud or you know, other servers in your um, data center or whatever, but you can break up your application much more easily if you use an external message broker. And cloud is kind of going to be a, a big deal for a lot of us. Um, it's, it's a lot of people are deploying already. How many people are deploying to cloud right now for production apps? I just want to... Okay, so guys, there we've got about... Um, 15 or so people already deploying to cloud. Uh, is that mostly Amazon? Anyone deploying to Cloud Foundry? No? No? Okay. It doesn't matter. I'm no longer a Cloud Foundry developer advocate, so it doesn't worry me anymore. Um, but the, the PASs, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, uh, they will pick up, and I think more and more people will be deploying to those. Most people go for Amazon, though, and more and more people will be going for some form of cloud deployment. Just simplifies things, but uh, it also is easier to set up these kind of application architectures where you split them across different parts of the cloud. So in terms of messaging, what options do you have? Um, there are events, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, Spring integration and Apache Camel. So I th most people will hopefully know this one by now. These are based on enterprise integration patterns, a book, and this concept of pipes and filters. Uh, that, and that's one uh, option. Project Reactor is a fairly new one. So this is very interesting because one of the concerns often about messaging is performance. Because you're no longer uh, working with memory directly, you're sending messages around. If you're sending like thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of messages to get your system working, uh, is that, are those messages going to be a bottleneck in your system? Uh, Project Reactor gives you a consistent API onto different message implementations, one of which is the LMAX disruptor, which is known to deal with millions of messages a second. So messaging is now becoming less of a performance concern, partly due to LMAX disruptor. Still, you do need to be aware of how these things work to ensure that your particular messaging system matches the implementation, that it works properly together. Um, and that's all, these are all internal memory ones. So you don't actually have to deploy multiple applications. You just deploy one application, but use messaging internally. Uh, JMS and RabbitMQ, and you can um, use ZeroMQ. There are other external uh, messaging systems as well. So Spring integration is nice uh, because it it's 
if you build the logic of if if a lot of your application logic is uh, about message processing and how to route messages, um, transform them, uh, generate reports on the fly, and then they become messages. Uh, you get these particular endpoints. So a splitter can take a message and send it to two different locations. Uh, one could be JMS or one could be Twitter. Uh, and you have adapters that allow you to connect with external systems. So these are actually ideal when you need to integrate with mail servers, Twitter, Facebook, um, any, uh, an external message broker, any of these things. So uh, again, if you have properly considered your domain model and how it works, it should be very easy to work out whether this is a good architectural match for your particular application. Are you dealing with uh, these various integration points is our messages the appropriate uh, mode that you use of operation uh, and of course spring integration gets a groovy DSL uh, which makes it nice and easy to set up these things okay on the other hand messaging does have introduced issues especially around debugging did my message get sent was it received did it get corrupted what the hell happened? I don't know. Help! Uh, call Stefan Maldini. He's the only one who knows how this stuff works. Um, there are various uh, uh, techniques to aid in debugging messaging systems, but they are fundamentally harder than pure in-memory uh, ones. Except in-memory threading issues. They are impossible. They are, they are the um, quantum mechanics of coding. Because just by observing the problem, it fixes itself. So you never know why it's not working. Um, but messaging adds extra uh, different types of issues. Code comprehension, it's much harder to just click through in your IDE to work out how things are all connected. You need to be aware of the, like your spring integration flow or um, just where messages are going. It's kind of useful to have documentation about uh, the general flow of where messages are going. And I already mentioned performance. Um, by basically not having mutable memory, you can introduce uh, performance issues. But as I said, things like Project Reactor can give you very fast messaging performance. Um, and to be honest, Lots of people are not doing very performance critical stuff, or it's at the database level that you're actually hitting bottlenecks and the like. Okay, so there is a special form of messaging, which is events-based systems. So messaging is I can send a message to tell something, to do whatever, um, but events are very specifically, something has happened. I'm going to let the world know. And then somebody on the other end says, I'm actually interested in these things. Uh, I'm a little bit sad, actually. Uh, I don't know how well Grails Events is going at the moment. Is anyone using Grails Events plugin? Have we got almost no one? No. A couple of hands. A couple of nervous hands. They're just like, no, not really. <laughs> I don't want to admit to it. Um, it's a very nice approach. You can integrate it into services. Uh, but you don't have to use services for it. But it, it basically also gives you a, a nice uh, API, an event bus. You know, you publish an event to the event bus and you register listeners with it and all the internal uh, routing of messages happens automatically for you. It's great, very convenient. Um, and it does mean that you can then distribute your application uh, to some degree. Okay, so this is something I, I did in the grails.org web application. But again, it was, it was difficult to know when messages, uh, events were actually managing to go from one part of the application to the other. Uh, the Grails events, you know, if it continues, I'm, I'm nervous about recommending it because I think development has stalled somewhat on Grails events. But the idea is fantastic. You can... Uh, add an adapter which sends events through an external broker so now you can have multiple application instances 
um, and other applications in different VMs listening to the event bus in another application. Or you can send it to the browser over WebSockets. Or, in fact, uh, Events Push is currently using Atmosphere. Um, I noticed that Spring, Spring introduced support for SockJS, which allows you to, if WebSockets is not available, it will uh, cleanly degrade to uh, long polling or other techniques for doing that persistent connection, sending events to the browser, to and from the browser. So uh, if you've got something like a real-time chat application, because everybody needs real-time chat in their applications, uh, actually this particular architecture works really nicely. You need to be aware of security. You know, you do not want to send your, uh, probably your persistence events through to the browser. That's probably a bad idea. Um, clients shouldn't be seeing those things. So you do need to be aware of those kinds of things. And I'm just going to end up with uh, a more traditional approach. So I remember talking about developing Grails applications as collections of plugins. So now we're just talking about uh, not a monolithic application, but a single application modularized along the lines of plugins. Um, you can have your normal groovy classes, command objects, services, whatever, or domain classes, whatever you need, uh, separated into different plugins. The question is, how do your plugins interact with each other? Because inevitably, they will need to. It's very hard to have a uh, architecture where they are completely distinct and only the application talks to them. So one approach is, you know, hey, classes, calling methods on other classes in a different plugin. Yeah, that's very easy to do. Uh, but you've now got tight coupling between plugins. And that is where madness lies. It works well for the early simple cases, but later on, it gets really messy and you've ended up, in effect, you've modularized your application with plugins and suddenly it becomes the great ball of mud model again. And it's a monolithic application where you've just got plugins inter uh, interrelated in really complex and hard to understand ways. So if you do go for this kind of architecture, why not use something like the event bus or a me an internal message broker, uh, Spring integration or something? to allow the plugins to communicate with each other. Uh, and now, if you decide that you want to split out, uh, if you want to introduce a second application using Feature Plugin 3, it's very easy to split that out. You're still talking over the event bus, but now um, you've got two applications. The decoupling has already been done. That's very easy to set up. Okay, so that's it for different application architectures. Um, I'm hoping I've given you some ideas for the approaches you can take in Grails. I don't go in depth into any of those particular architectures because really the aim of this talk is to get you to think. It's like, what is this application supposed to be doing? Get that domain model first work out an appropriate architecture afterwards. Get that context. Don't go the standard route automatically. You can go the standard route, but think about it first. So thank you for listening. Hope you've had some good ideas. Thank you. Uh, so I believe there's five minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Like, what were those projects that you worked on where you apologized for these things? No. OK, so thank you. So I think that's a, an early break, is it? 15, 10, 15 minute break? And I'll be doing a, a 15 minute quickie on Lazy Bones later, if anyone wants to come along to that, 5 o'clock.